Hello and welcome to the Curious Minds Podcast. This is Evan Van Sickle at the Christian Student Center right across the street from the University of New Mexico. Just had another orientation group rip through today. Getting to see all the new freshmen getting ready to begin their college experience. A lot of them moving out of the house to do so, but a lot of them staying at home since Albuquerque plants a lot of their high school graduates right here at the university. They get to stay home, save some money on housing, and get their education. An encouraging sign the last few days, a lot of students interested in developing their faith all the more as they enter college and as they continue through their college years. They sound intent on growing in the faith and not just being a part of whatever flow they happen to be dipped in. So that's good for them. I'm happy for them. I'm here for them. And I would like to see what comes of their college years and to hear stories of how they've been strengthened through it. So good to meet them. Uh, I'm glad that there are churches and high schools in the area that are equipping students to be strong in their college years. But regardless of whether students are coming as Christians or non-Christians, I believe that there are big questions of life, of God, of salvation, questions that need to be engaged with carefully, important questions, and questions that if we just let things develop and get busy around us, we may not focus on those questions the way we should. We may not give them the attention that they deserve. So I'm here to remind people, hey, there is a set of incredibly important issues regarding the nature of man, the nature of God, and the nature of harmonizing the two that we need to be focused on. Because if God exists, he is our creator. And if that's our creator, then we are created for some purpose that reflects our creator. Now, to be effective in that, I've found the niche in Christian apologetics, that is, defending the Christian faith using things like logic, evidence, reasoning, research, history, or the area that I like, in particular, philosophy. Now, this creates a bridge in order to have quality conversations with people from various backgrounds, various religious upbringings. But regardless of the person's upbringing, we owe to them to be able to listen to them well we also owe the ability to be able to converse well, to understand positions well, to ask the right kinds of questions, and to think well through what they have to offer. Just in my week here, I've come across several different worldviews that are very, very different, from atheism to radical spin-offs of Christianity, and several things in between. And some people that have very little upbringing that fail to realize the importance of the question of the existence of God and how we should go about investigating that. So I investigate that from a bit of a unique perspective because I think it can contribute to where students are at in their college experience. And it deals with critical thinking. If we can apply critical thinking to the big questions of faith, then I think we can come out with people who are stronger in the faith after engaging with it on such levels. Now, I think that the best way to come through critical thinking successfully while still maintaining a vibrant faith is through a Christian worldview. My claim is the Christian worldview will satisfy the heaviest critical thinking. That's what I want to show in this part three of the critical thinking series. So in parts one and two, we looked at a couple of fallacies and gave examples. We looked at the straw man fallacy in part one, and that gave us the challenge of representing another person's view accurately. Then in part two, we looked at the livability and self-consistency of a view, which challenges us to apply the same scrutiny that that view applies to other views back onto itself to see if it can fulfill its own claims. And we found some shortcomings there. But in identifying shortcomings in these alternate views, I also need to ask the question, can my faith stand up to such scrutiny? So in this part three, I want to look at how critical thinking and the Christian faith correspond. And what is the first thing that you think of when you hear the term critical thinking? What is something that you apply critical thinking to? 
I think that my response has been that critical thinking relates to evaluating other people's views. Here's what I think our tendency is, because it's been mine. We put in our time listening, hoping to gain some brownie points with the other person. After that, or maybe even during, we evaluate everything that they are saying so that we can pick it apart, make ourselves look good, and show off how much we know. Now, I'm not saying that we should not do or say anything until we have everything completely straightened out. That won't happen. The entire world would just go silent. But in one of the most popular passages in the Bible, Jesus informs people how to approach this. Mind you, this is also one of the most commonly misinterpreted sayings in the Bible. I think that looking at it a little more in context is going to help clarify some of its purpose. So here it is, the beginning of Matthew 7. Quote, do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and look, a log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. End quote. What do you think? Did Jesus bring this up because it was relevant or because it was irrelevant? It was probably extremely relevant. Those who Jesus criticized, both here and elsewhere, were the types of people who saw themselves as superior and loved pointing out all kinds of faults in everybody else. They made everyone else carry a bundle of heavy burdens, but they themselves would not so much as lift a finger. Why? Because they assume themselves to be positionally superior and thus, in some ways, above the law. There is a certain type of apologetics, or maybe pseudo-apologetics, that entirely focuses on examining the speck in another person's eye and ignoring the log in one's own eye. We have to be careful to guard ourselves against this. Many times this will manifest in what I might call sheep-blasting. This is where you find out what other Christian movements are doing and you proceed to make them look bad, either because of their successes, their differences, or even frustration over your own lack of progress. The most deceptive movements against accurate Christianity are often from within, i.e. the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Unitarian Universalist movements. While we don't want a sheep blast without redemptive biblical correction, we also do not want poison infiltrating those under our care. Let's refer back to the Matthew 7 passage here. We have to be willing to self-correct, at least as far as we are going to be critiquing others. That's the point. Here, toward the end of this portion on critical thinking, I want to explore how we can do that. By looking to the heart of Jesus and his instruction, I think we have a solid starting point. Honoring him needs to be the chief motivation for doing so. Shifting gears here, have you noticed the type of critiques that are often given in the popular sphere, such as YouTube? We can fall into the habits that we see as examples. Consequently, Christians will often take jabs that lack critical thinking, humility, and grace. Frankly, it doesn't matter how insulting the other side is, or how poor their critical thinking is. If we are content with correcting through an uncorrected tone, we are completely missing God's standard for our critical thinking skills to be an avenue for grace and the gospel. This means that Christians would do well to apply critical thinking to their own lives. They should apply as strict of critical thinking to their own view as they do to others as a church body of approximately 2 billion people at least in name, if we apply a dose of critical thinking, the strength of the body of Christ would quickly stun the worldview and religious landscape of the world. Sure, some say that if Christians would just think well, they would not be Christians any longer. However, I've seen exactly the opposite. Let's use some test examples to put this idea into practice. Let's hold to ourselves the same standard of consistency and reasonability that we often expect of others. Let's do more than teach critical thinking, reasoning, and logic as optional and academic disciplines, and let's allow such thought exercises to enrich our faith. 
even if it means that we could be wrong about something in our current faith. How can I say this? Because it's the standard that we demand of other views. Let this serve as Exhibit 1. When a Christian shares his faith with somebody of another faith, let's say a Muslim, he expects a Muslim to consider the idea that he could be wrong about the nature of God and the nature of Scripture. Consider how different this might be if the encounter is reversed. The Muslim approaches the Christian in order to share his faith. He also expects that the Christian consider the possibility that he might be wrong about the nature of God and the nature of Scripture. Most Christians are never told to entertain the question. Many of the same people who have never applied critical thinking to their own position expect others to apply critical thinking to a view that they live by. Okay, fine. You can be right without knowing why you're right. And if this is your position, why should you expect that anyone else do what you are unwilling to do? Why judge others to a standard that you're unwilling to be judged by? Why have the attitude, I can question you, but you cannot question me? If it is true, what are we afraid of? I'm not saying that we cannot call another perspective wrong unless we call our own perspective wrong. This is more about how rigorously the perspective is examined. I'm also not saying that we have to know as much about another perspective as our own. That is an unfair standard. Let me try an illustration here. Counterfeit money. Those who are trained to detect counterfeits spend much more time studying the authentic money than the counterfeit money. The person detecting the counterfeit needs to know enough about the counterfeit to be able to tell and to be able to show another person that it is indeed a counterfeit. He can reach this conclusion fairly quickly, compared to the time he spent knowing the authentic. What else do Christian evangelists and apologists press others on? These would represent more things that we ought to clarify. Let me shift to a new gear. Buckle up and hold on here. Last time we talked about identifying consistency. I brought up two major issues of critical thinking, livability and internal consistency. Along the way, we looked at some ideas, some philosophies that violated these. Unfortunately, some ideas common to Christians were also identified as faulty. Something like, if it ain't in the Bible, I ain't gonna believe it. This is self-defeating. Clearly, he believes his own statement. But if he believes it, his statement would not be true. To be honest, many or most of the criticisms that others make toward the Christian faith are peripheral issues. For example, did the creation days occur in specific 24-hour periods? Was Adam born in 4000 BC? Where did Cain find a wife? Was this incest? How could Noah get all those animals on a boat? How could water cover the whole earth? Then how could animals get back on the other continents? Why are there some numbers recorded in Kings different from the numbers in Chronicles? Why does David seem to say nasty things in the Psalms? What is the order of events in Jesus' life? How many angels were at the tomb? Why was the story of the woman caught in adultery not contained in some of the earliest manuscripts? Some non-believers assume that if one of these peripheral issues is unanswered, then the entire Christian paradigm crumbles. That's not the case. And I'm not saying that because such issues are oh so difficult. These are somewhat interesting, and I've examined the answers to such difficulties, which usually are not all that difficult. These can be more of a red herring, that is, an issue that takes us away from the main point. A red herring is used because the person is more comfortable conversing about these other things. I'm more interested in the big questions of the Christian faith. I more appreciate non-believers pressing into the bigger questions than the peripherals. Try these on for size. Does the existence of God make sense? What is God's relationship to capital G good? What is the best way to make sense of human moral intuition? Is there an objective moral law? Should we think that God is a trinity? Is the trinity a contradiction? What is the nature of man? Does the biblical description match human experience and intuition? 
Is the Bible divinely inspired or merely a human construct? Does the sovereignty of God contradict human free will? Why did God create people who would just mess up? Can God's goodness and justice correspond with the doctrine of hell? Couldn't God just simply save who he wants? Why is a Messiah required in order to appease God's wrath and justice? Just an educated guess here. Most Christians never make a critical evaluation of the internal consistency of their faith. They're often told that such an evaluation is bad for their faith, dishonoring toward God. They think that it asks questions of things that we are not supposed to know, or that it's a time waster since we'll never know until we get to heaven. If that's the case, then put away your Bibles, quit wasting time in fellowship, prayer, and worship. After all, those will all be limited this side of heaven. But I think that what we glean here on earth contributes and colors our future. Before I go off on that, let me just leave it at that. It's worth pursuing depth of faith and the truths of God. Some of this takes critical thinking. Critical thinking is a servant of faith, not its opponent. Now here's a brief overview of why the Christian faith is consistent and rationally coherent. Buckle up, you may want to rewind and re-listen to this part. The Judeo-Christian story of origins best explains our existence. The dependent, temporally finite, and decaying nature of the physical universe implies that there must be a creator. This creator cannot be the universe, nor a subject of it, but distinct from it. There can only be one God, because two beings with the exact same perfections, the same locus of goodness, the same will, the same actions, and the same capabilities would not be separate entities, but the same thing. There cannot be two things which are omnipresent, that is, in every place, in the same way. A room cannot be completely filled with hot air and completely filled with cold air. God makes good sense out of the moral intuition that each person senses within him or her. The very basis of human value and purpose makes sense if we are created by a value-giving agent. It seems that everybody lives as though his or her life is defined by purpose and thus lives as though a transcendent value-giver exists. No one lives as though he determines whether or not his life has purpose. He lives as though it already does. Christian faith is very livable in this regard. Christianity makes sense of the depravity of human nature. It both explains why we know better and why we often tend against what we know. We have the image of God but are led astray by a sinful, fallen nature. This causes us to follow various passions quick fix gratifications rather than lasting benefit and satisfaction. Humanity is constantly faced with the idea that we are not what we are supposed to be. Christianity emphasizes the chasm between man and God very clearly. Bridging this chasm between man and the ultimate is the aim of every religion I can think of. Christianity recognizes that this chasm is unbridgeable if man is left to his own. Since the fallenness and depravity of man is continually the problem in the first place, it seems unreasonable to look to fallen man as the resolution. Thus, Christian salvation is coherent given the limitations of man and the perfect nature of God. Humans can never reach up far enough, but God can reach down if he cares to. Given that God, presumably the perfect mind, chose to create this world with special creatures called humans, it seems that he would have a deep connection love toward these creatures. These humans also may be the only part of creation that consciously question and pursue the divine. If we are creations of God, it makes sense that we would have intense desires to pursue God. Evil exists. This is commonly seen as an indictment, even a contradiction to Christian theology. However, evil is a difficult problem for any worldview. Non-theistic viewpoints have a greater struggle in that they have a very weak basis from which good and evil can even be meaningful concepts. But if God is the perfect locus of goodness, there can be a meaningful definition of evil. Evil is that which falls short of the good, which corrupts the good, or which restricts the expression of the good. I've thought about it like this, and it seems to match beautifully with every consideration of evil in the moral law. Finally, the person of Jesus. 
Yes, it is difficult to conceptualize God becoming a man. It is hard to map out something like the traditional Christian trinity. Still, it makes good sense of the interpersonal nature of all things and the social nature of humans. We are relational, and relational is good because God is eternally relational. The Trinity makes sense of the concept of God's love. And through the Trinity, the Christ, the greatest love, was displayed. Christ is the only option for bridging the gap between humanity and God. He is a sacrifice of infinite worth, worthy of appeasing the justice of God. Only through Christ could God remain perfectly just, and yet mankind could be viewed as right with God. If God could not redeem us, pay off our account to him, you might say that it was a mistake for him to create us, for creation would not fulfill its purpose. Christianity, when you really dig in and critically evaluate it, fulfills what we observe of ourselves and of creation. It is livable and internally consistent. We will hash out more of these details in upcoming podcasts. Please choose to pursue these things. Pursue him with all you've got. So this has been part three of the Critical Thinking series, part three of three. So after this, we'll bridge into some more of the current events, current conversations that have been taking place here in Albuquerque at the university and with some of the various groups that I stay a part of. And I hope this has encouraged you to think well about your Christian faith, to think well about evaluating other beliefs, and if you are on the fence about what you believe or why you believe what you believe, I hope this has encouraged you to dig into the importance of some of the big questions about God, human existence, and the merging of the two. Please join me next time as we carry on with a new chapter on this The Curious Minds podcast. Until then, love you guys. May God bless and guide you.